Why did Halloween 3 Season of the Witch flop? There's a few reasons. Released just shy of a year after Halloween 2, Halloween 3 The Season of the Witch dropped on October 22nd, 1982. With an exact budget of $2.5 million, matching that of Halloween 2's budget, yet it's one of the lowest rated and second to last when it comes to the worldwide box office. Why is that? Let's find out. Welcome back, I'm Sippin' Eyes, and off the jump, I enjoy this movie for what it is, and I'll explain why as we go along. But spoiler warning, obviously for the movie released in the 80s, but there's two solid reasons why moviegoers didn't originally enjoy this movie. But over the years, it eventually developed a cult following, with me joining them. No longer directed by John Carpenter, that title fell to Tommy Lee Wallace, but luckily for us, Carpenter still produced the score. We open up to a Northern California town, it's a Saturday night, October the 23rd, as a man is sprinting away. While the car is in hot pursuit, he is seemingly able to hide. That is, until he is grabbed and taken to the ground by a random suited man. He reaches and grabs a chain freeing a car that was apparently left in neutral, allowing it to roll and eliminate the would-be killer. Before we move on, this movie is silly, and it requires you to turn your brain off and join them along the ride if you intend on enjoying the movie. Because for instance, that car rolled approximately 3 miles per hour and squeaked due to death. Bro got killed by an inconvenience. The man is able to escape his pursuers. One hour later, we see a gas station employee straight up chilling as the TV tells us about one of the stones at Stonehenge being stolen. How? I don't know, neither does the reporter. It's a sizable rock, but they soon cut to a commercial. The Silver Shamrock commercial, a company selling some Halloween masks. This theme song has always stuck with me. Every October, you can catch me bumping this song to get me in the mood. Pause. The man from earlier shows up holding one of those said masks in his hand. So the employee takes him to the hospital. This is when we meet Dr. Daniel Fallis. No, I mean Chalice. He has to leave his ex-wife and kids to go to the hospital to treat the man. All while his kids wear their new silver shamrock mask and watch the commercial from about four inches from the screen. If you don't mess with the theme song, then boy, I got some bad news for you, as it plays back to back throughout the film. A man in a suit puts on some gloves and enters the injured man's hospital room and proceeds to suffer. Oh, what the shit is he doing to dude? He like pulled his nose in order to kill him and then heads outside to blow himself up in order to hide his tracks. That's right, a random man did the kill. This movie has no Michael Myers, and that's one of, if not the primary reason many people didn't enjoy or even give this movie a chance. Instead of following the mass killer of the two previous films, the franchise decided to become an anthology series. But because this film was so poorly received, they reverted those changes as Michael does reappear again in the next movie. But if you are receiving this video well, then be sure to hit that like button and subscribe as I have recently done the entire Scream franchise, and I'm currently working on the Halloween franchise. So, Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers is up next, so be on the lookout for that one. October the 24th, Ellie Grimbridge confirms it was her dad that was killed. I mention that as she is of importance. Wednesday, October the 27th, at a bar, Daniel has the bartender change the TV channel. He ends up leaving on a football game, but before that, the movie Halloween is shown, confirming it as a film in this movie's world. Soon, Ellie shows up and begins a team up with Daniel. They drive on over to Santa Mira, home of the Silver Shamrock novelties, in order to get some answers. The suited men are hidden all around the town as they enter. All the while, the citizens here just kind of stare, just kind of watching them. Eventually, the two arrive to a motel, soon followed by Buddy and Betty Cupfer, as well as another woman. Apparently, this motel is a hot ticket item because it's just back to back. A random romance side plot just starts happening here as well which is another reason, albeit a minor reason, why some may have not liked this movie. It's just kind of unneeded and felt kind of forced for the sake of having the two leads get freaky. As night approaches, town-wide speakers installed by the president of this tiny town, Colonel Cochran, spout out the curfew is now in effect and that everyone must remain indoors during the night. As cameras monitor the streets, I wonder why. Later, a local drunk man badmouthed Cochran and threatened his factory. 
causing some of the suits to kill. Oh my god, they pulled his head off. The last lady that showed up to the motel, Marge, talks to Ellie about the masks and their lower quality because her daughter threw the mask and caused a branded circle to fall out. What could that be? Just before going to bed, she notices on the ground. The back of it has a computer chip in it. She begins messing with it when all of a sudden a lightsaber turns on, killing her with some amazing practical effects. That's a huge upside for the movie. The practical effects alongside the gore. Until later entries, this movie was by far the most gruesome. Mr. Cochran shows up with his scientists to take away Marge's body as Daniel and Ellie are forced to watch. This movie, like the rest of the franchise, doesn't try to hide who the bad guy is. This movie paints Cochran to be the Dr. Evil of this world off the rip. Saturday, October the 30th, one more day till Halloween. The Cuffer family along with the Smith family meet up with Cochran and are given the guided tour of the factory. The Cuffer's son is given a mask by Cochran himself that has been given those final touches. As he puts on the mask, we see the same patch that killed Marge. The Smith family heads to the exit after spotting the suits and then even spotting Ellie's father's car. Being freaked out, they prepare to skip town. Daniel goes to call the police, but the lines are dead. So he just heads back and sees Ellie is gone. Damn, Daniel. <laughs> Sorry. She really just up and left you. Oh, no, uh, okay. The suits are here and they took her. And now they want Daniel. He manages to escape out the bathroom window. He's able to make it to the factory in order to try and save his newly kindled romance. He finds a woman doing a little sewing and demands to know where she is. Where are they? Killing is making a choice. Where are they? But by doing so, he knocks her head off. She's a robot and so are the suits who attack and capture Daniel. Sunday, October the 31st, Halloween day. Cochran takes Daniel into the final processing room where we get the usual villain monologue. Remember when we were told the stone from Stonehenge had been stolen? That's what Cochrane is using to create the evil mask. Pieces of the stone are placed into those silver shamrock patches, allowing the mask to kill anyone wearing it at the time. We are shown this when the young Cuffer's son watches the infamous commercial while wearing the pumpkin mask. The mask activates, ending the poor boy. The mask also allows for the mass creation of bugs and snakes, with dozens crawling around. We then cut to a shot of kids all across the country wearing the mask as the final commercial plays on. I didn't mention this lady once, because she doesn't really play that vital of a role. She's a co-worker of Daniel's that has been examining some ashes, but nearing the end she gets drilled in the head and Cochran's attempts at covering his tracks. Speaking of Cochran, as he finishes up his monologue to the signature Halloween theme, he places a mask on Daniel and just lets him watch the original Halloween movie until it's time for the big one. John Carpenter, of course, killed it on the score, but he didn't direct this movie, and it shows. It's not poorly directed, mind you, but it has a more silly and lighthearted tone and feel to it, whereas Carpenter's directing had a more serious and eerie feeling, and I believe that to be the other major reason why viewers didn't turn out and didn't tune in for this third outing because originally John Carpenter didn't want this movie to be made, nor did he want to direct it. And with him being one of the reasons the original is so beloved, it might have caused some disdain for this movie. And tack on the no Myers treatment, just had audiences not really feeling this movie. Daniel escaped his chair and makes his way to Ellie and unties her. They begin to flee, all while Cochran sends his suits to find them. As they hide, they find a box of those shamrock patches. Daniel sneaks off and stealthily approaches the control panel that's surrounded by robots and Cochran. Pros the ghost. Meanwhile, I'm over here freaking out about how no one sees dude walking up. There's literally robot dudes looking at the damn camera. Hi, how are you? Yet they don't see Daniel's goofy ass creeping up like he's about to steal the Krabby Patty secret formula. Like how, dude? You can't keep getting away with this! You can't keep getting away with it! I'm sorry. I'm asking too many questions. He turns on the commercial and as he runs back to Ellie, he's finally spotted. The home team makes it to a catwalk above everyone and begins raining down those patches, eliminating every robot leaving just Cochran there, who then evaporates as the stone blows up the factory. Oz! What is that? The Smith family did it. They drive away as the town burns, but something is wrong with Ellie. 
She attacks Daniel in what I can only assume will lead to a nasty divorce. John, I want a divorce. Divorce. <laughs> it's not funny, John, and you know it's been coming for a long time. Fifteen years and all I've heard from you is laughter! Divorce. <laughs> Stop laughing. On a real note, it's not actually Ellie. Not anymore, anyway. She was turned into a robot. Daniel goes Jason Voorhees and knocks her head clean off her shoulders. Daniel runs off, making it to the same gas station from the beginning. Three kids come in to get candy and watch the commercial, as it's playing on three channels. The first two are taken down, but the third? The film ends as Daniel screams for the commercial to be taken off the air. So Halloween 3, The Season of the Witch is good, the way I choose to look at it, that is. Take away the name Halloween and just watch it for what it is, and it's a fun, silly, and sometimes gory ride. Many people despise this movie because of the lack of Michael Myers and the change in directors, but given the score, the practical effects, and the look of the mask, and even low-key the theme song of the commercial makes me enjoy this film. It's not the best, but it's certainly not the worst. If created with a new name and a separate franchise, I could see this movie having been much more successful. But with those downsides I've described, it lowers it down on the totem pole for many. I personally would have to rate Halloween 3, The Season of the Witch, a 6.5 out of 10. It provides some iconic lines and looks that has stuck with me since I was a kid, but the silly CGI and random love plot brought it down a little. But with that being said, what do you rank this movie? Let me know down in the comments, and if you enjoyed this, please be sure to hit that like button and subscribe as we have Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers up next. As always, I appreciate you and your time. Stay chill, and I will see you next time.